1996, Bill Gates said, content is king. And boy was he right. Three decades later, it still occupies the throne. For lawyers, law firms, and companies serving the legal industry, content marketing and thought leadership marketing are a must if they want to build their books of business or increase their revenues. Hi, I'm Wayne Pollock. I'm a former AmLaw50 senior associate who discovered the world of content marketing and thought leadership marketing and hasn't looked back. In each episode of this podcast, I interview lawyers and legal industry in-house marketers who are doing big things with their content marketing and thought leadership marketing. This is Legally Contented. Welcome to episode number 32 of Legally Contented. I'm your host, Wayne Pollock. Could publishing a legal blog turn you into a celebrity? Could it cause readers of your blog to want to take pictures with you at events you're speaking at? Could it cause your blog readers to call you the Pope of your area of the law or the Tom Hanks of your area of the law? For my guest in this episode, Kevin LaCroix, the answer is yes. Kevin is an attorney and executive vice president at RT Pro Exec, which is an insurance intermediary focused on management liability issues. Kevin's been involved in directors and officers liability insurance for over 35 years. And of relevance to us, for the last decade and a half or so, he has written a blog called The Dino Diary. In this conversation, we cover Kevin's approach to blogging, from the style with which he writes to how he uncovers the topics that he writes about, to his overall philosophy when it comes to content marketing and thought leadership marketing efforts. And of course, we get into the benefits of his blog and how it's impacted his professional and personal life, including people calling him the Pope of Dino Insurance, people calling him the Tom Hanks of Dino Insurance, and people lining up to get photos with him at the events he's speaking at. All joking aside, though, about Kevin's achieving celebrity status in the Dino Insurance world, the fact that he is widely recognized as a leading authority, if not the leading authority, in the Dino Insurance world speaks to the power of content marketing and thought leadership marketing, especially when you're doing so within a niche. This conversation was a lot of fun, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. As a heads up, for some reason, Zoom was not cooperating with us as well as it normally does, so there might be some instances where you hear the audio go in and out. It doesn't affect the overall quality of the podcast, but I want to give you a heads up that there will be times where you will know this episode was recorded over Zoom. Enjoy my chat with Kevin. Kevin LaCroix, welcome to Legally Contented. Please introduce yourself for our audience. I'm Kevin LaCroix, Executive Vice President at RT Pro Exec. Kevin, we're here because you graciously accepted my invitation to nerd out a bit regarding your blogging efforts, specifically your DNO diary. Before we get into your blogging efforts, let's talk a little bit about your background and your legal career. You spent about nine years earlier in your life at a law firm, and then you then left to join another company before heading to RT, which is your current employer. Can you talk a little bit about what life was like for you after you graduated Michigan Law back in the early 80s, what life was like practicing law in the 80s, and what kind of drove you from the private practice of law at a firm to your current career path? So it it was a long time ago when I started practicing law. Uh, Lawyers wore suits every day. That might be hard for some of the younger lawyers to relate to. Probably the two biggest differences between then and now um, are technology and uh, Firm staffing. Uh, Firm staffing, I I had a secretary, which I'm sure a lot of young attorneys now can't even comprehend. I was fortunate. I I had a series of very good legal secretaries, and they were very helpful to me, frankly, as a young lawyer, because they knew more than I did at at the outset. Uh, Technology, obviously, you know, no email, no cell phones. Um, I had to fight when I first started as a new associate at my firm to get a computer on my desk. It was a very controversial request that was viewed suspiciously by the senior partners at the firm. Um, you know, my son is a three-year associate at a New York law firm now, so I have a pretty good standard of comparison. And I'd say the day-to-day, the biggest thing for him, you know, if I work late, I was at my desk, whereas he can work late, but go home and have dinner with his family first and then power up his laptop and work as long as he wants, much more civilized. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I view that as a positive development. Uh, you know, he, he's working every bit as hard as I did then. So that part probably isn't all that positive. But at least there's a little bit more room for um, civility with the advent of technology. What area of law did you practice when you were in a private firm? Um, well, pertinent to what we're going to be talking about, I, I pretty quickly developed a, a specialty in representing uh, Dean Ownshire's in insurance coverage matters. 
Um, I did other things. I did some insurance defense work, defense work. I had a very small commercial practice as well. But mostly what I was doing was coverage work for DNO insurers. How'd you get started there? Um, my wife was a an associate at one of the large Washington, D.C. law firms, then called Hogan and Hartson, now Hogan Lovells. And a small group of young partners from that firm spun off to form their own law firm. And I knew them individually, and I knew I would like working with them. So once I was sure that they were going to make it as a, as a financial <laughs> venture, I... Uh, I left the firm I'd started with very briefly and went to join them. And that was the main practice they took with them when they, they started their own firm. So I chose those individuals as people I wanted to practice law with rather than the law practice. That was sort of a subsidiary consideration for me. And as you, you spend, what, nine, almost 10 years at that firm, what made you decide to leave the firm and pursue a, a different kind of legal career? I didn't actively seek to change. It kind of found me. Um, I had a very active uh, litigation practice and was working very hard at that. And out of the blue, got an unsolicited bid from an individual that was starting a, 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 an insurance startup company, spinning it out of the progressive insurance company. And um, he was familiar with a case that I'd worked on and he knew I had the skill set that he needed. And he made an offer. It was a much longer process. I'll telescope it for purposes mm -hmm. of this conversation. But in the end, he persuaded me that it would be in my long-term interest to take the, not the entrepreneurial risk and join him. And you know, time has shown that it was definitely worth the risk. But I, I wasn't looking to change jobs. I was quite happy. I was a young partner. I, you know, I had a good uh, stable of reliable sources of business. So at that point, life was good. I, I really was not actively looking to change. It just life uh, opened another door for me. Serendipity happens and life yes. changes. It's just fascinating that the doors yeah. that open that A, you didn't know were there and B, you might be, you might have some apprehension about going through and then magically it's hard to look back and say, gee, what would my life be like if I didn't go through those doors? One thing I that's pertinent for your listeners though, I was 37, maybe 38. My wife and I, who my wife was also a partner in a law firm. We had three small children. Um, we were successful lawyers and, and we were making it work, but it was crazy. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. And uh, the the idea that there might be another way to have an interesting, sophisticated legal practice without it being so crazy really appealed to both of us. And that was, that was a big factor in yeah, the analysis. I, I always think the families that have two lawyers as parents, maybe perhaps even two big law partners as parents, it looks great on the resume and it looks great at cocktail parties, but the day to day of parenting and family life is outsourced to a nanny, mm -hmm. to extended care after school. And I'm not passing judgment on that, except to say, rarely do things go smoothly, either in the office or in the home office these days, or at school with the kids. And mm -hmm. it's just to your point, things can go crazy for no one's fault and it reverberates. And sometimes the riskier move, what seems like the riskier move is actually the safer move, giving you a bit more flexibility, even if it's going to be a crazy fly by seat of your pants yeah. entrepreneurial journey, it might actually be more stimulating to you in a way that keeps you refreshed for your home life, your family life, or what have you. It was all of that, but I did walk away from a Pennsylvania Avenue law, law partnership to go join an insurance startup in suburban Cleveland. So. It, it takes a, a risk-taking uh, capacity as well. Yeah, and once you got over the fact that everyone would give you a double take when you explained what you were doing, <laughs> I'm sure those conversations went well. All right, so that was Genesis. Now talk about your move from Genesis to where you're at now with RT. So um, I had a great job at Genesis. I loved it. It was a great organization. Um, I was very fortunate in, in a large insurance corporation to have a reporting relationship that was fruitful, productive, um, you know, helped me grow as a person, helped me grow as a, as a professional. I didn't see how the personal relationship I had with the person that I reported to was so critical to everything. And then he retired and I went up with a very different kind of reporting relationship that was not fruitful. It was not productive. It did not reinforce me as a professional. And I lasted about a year and it was getting, it was just getting worse. It was a downward spiral. And I was sitting in a meeting one day and I finally just had this moment of clarity. And I said to the people in the room, I think I see the path forward here. I think I need to quit right now. <laughs> and it, it didn't take long, but we very quickly negotiated a, a, a surrender <laughs> agreement. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I had a very interesting phone call to my wife uh, to make after that meeting ended. Uh, but it was the smartest thing I ever did. It was, you know, you, you need to recognize when you're in a bad situation and you need to deal with it. And I was committed to trying to make it work, but it wasn't working. And um, to make a long story short, after a search period of about six months, I wound up in a business partnership with two industry colleagues who I knew well from my, my work with Genesis, forming a specialty insurance wholesale brokerage company that um, our, our product is providing service to publicly traded companies who need DNO insurance. And we advise them on how to structure and place their insurance program. It's amazing what you experienced at Genesis is probably experienced at law firms consistently these days where you have younger associates, maybe even junior partners, build relationships with mentors, build relationships with partners who might even feed them business, keep those associates or junior partners busy, well-fed, and then something happens to that partner, maybe that senior partner, maybe they pass away, maybe they get sick, maybe they lateral, and for some family reason or some other non-work reason, that mentee can't make the move, and they're on an island all of a sudden, right? Like once your blocker Mm -hmm. leaves and you're exposed, it's just fascinating that probably happens more than we appreciate at- It's it's a hard situation. To someone that's in that situation, I would say, protect yourself, do what you need to be in a professional situation that fulfills you and believe in yourself. Yeah, right at the beginning, you know, like when I quit my job back in 2005, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Uh, I was 50 years old. I had a, my oldest child was entering college, but I knew I, I needed to make a change. And so, you know, you just need to believe in yourself. Um, you know, you're stronger than, than you know, and, and you're better than you give yourself credit for a lot of the time. So just be positive and believe in yourself and, and make sure you stay in it. You are in a situation that's fulfilling. And if you're not, do something about it. Can you talk a little bit about your business development and marketing efforts at Genesis and currently today at RT? What kind of marketing and business development efforts are you making? Are people in your position expected to bring on new clients? To talk to me a little bit about that, because I think that will inform our discussion about DNO Diary blog shortly. Every organization, I mean, we're talking about three very different kinds of organizations, but every organization needs to develop revenue, needs to grow revenue, needs to constantly be looking over the horizon to where business is going to, going to come from down the road. The way I went about doing that at the law firm when I was at Genesis and now my current job is very different. At the law firm, I was doing very traditional things, writing for professional publications, trying to speak at industry events, um, and trying to leverage existing relationships to to provide new business. That was probably the most important one there, is trying to expand your entry point into existing clients. Um, When I was on the insurer side, we developed our business, our business distribution, so to speak, was through agents. And so we needed to have relationships with agents. And so I spent a lot of time visiting and getting to know and uh, presenting myself to agents in order to encourage them to do business with us. In my current job, um, we're wholesale brokers, meaning we get our business from retail agents. So uh, a large part of what I do is, again, trying to develop agency relationships to open up new relationships, to expand existing relationships. But there's also brand marketing. Um, RT is a national firm. It's it's actually an international firm. But, you know, in my space, which is professional liability insurance, it's the largest uh, professional liability insurance wholesale broker. And so we're constantly trying to expand that into new ways, new products, new new relationships. And a part of it is just going out and listening and hearing what people need and seeing if we can develop the expertise to service those needs. But developing the brand is very important too, and that's where the blog comes in. And I assume that's what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of this call. But the blog um, was not something that I started with the idea that it was gonna be part of the marketing. It was really just something I started because I was at an abstract way kind of interested in the idea. And it only later matured into something that was a, a fruitful. Going on to Dino Diary, Talk to me a little a bit about why you started that and when it moved from being just something that you were curious about to something that you saw could be a branding and marketing play for you and RT. Yeah, I, you kind of have to go back to what I was doing professionally at the time that I started the blog. I, I just changed jobs. I just gone from being 
on the insurance company side to going to becoming a wholesale insurance broker. And um, because it was not a field I'd been active in before, I didn't have any clients. Uh, so right away, I, I didn't have um, things to do just to occupy my day when I was sitting at my desk waiting for the phone to ring. And, and just really out of curiosity, um, I started experimenting with the blogging format. Um, I, I'd always done writing professionally, so that was of interest to me. And the idea of using technology to kind of expand the reach appealed to me. And so using the, the Blogger app from Google, I set up my own blog, um, really, ju again, just out of curiosity, and um, had no preconceived plan of how I was going to use it once I set it up. Um, it, it happened that when I did that, the um, financial world was in the middle of the options backdating crisis. And it just happened that there was a lot to write about just at that moment. And so I wrote a lot about options backdating and it wound up getting um, attention. I wound up getting calls from reporters. I wound up getting calls from practitioners and my readership grew pretty quickly because of that. So that, you know, that positive feedback kind of reinforced the experience um, and encouraged me to continue to do it and write about other topics. And as my readership steadily grew, I became persuaded that this was something worth spending my time on, although still not quite, quite sure what the long run financial benefits might be. It took a while. It took quite a period of time, I would say several years, before I felt like I was finally seeing a financial payback as opposed to a personal and psychological payback. Uh, but getting a financial payback for the time I was spending, um, and, and it took a while for that to de develop, and it took a while for it to become something substantial. It's now to the point where I can feel, say pretty confidently, that it has been a very effective uh, mechanism for expanding my marketing and business development reach and um, and developing my own personal brand. I'm, I'm fortunate that in, in my uh, specialty, I have a, quite a bit of name recognition now because of the blog. Um, and that, that has proven very helpful and very fruitful for me. It's now been 16 years, so I'm, I'm quite a ways down the road and a lot has happened along the way. Uh, but I never had a plan when I started that I was going to be doing this for 16 years or it was going to have all those dividends. That's just kind of the way it played out. Um, and I'm grateful for that and fortunate that it turned out that way. But I think I would have still kept doing it because I found that I enjoyed doing it. It was rewarding, um, intellectually fulfilling. And, you know, that's what kept me going and has kept me going for 16 years. What's the connection between the subject matter and your target audience, your target would be clients. I'm assuming those, I think you said those would be brokers. It's one thing if you were a Dino insurance attorney and you wanted to reach out to executives and general counsel, you would write a similar blog to what you're doing now. What's the connection for you and for your would be clients? What's in it for them to be consuming this kind of content? Yeah, for that to make sense, I need to step back a little bit and explain our business approach. So um, if you're an insurance agent in a strip mall in a suburb of some city, you know, you can handle most of the business that comes your way. But then you find out that your brother-in-law is a CFO of a company that's about to go public. And you'd like to be able to place the insurance for that publicly traded company or about to be publicly traded company, but you know you don't have the expertise to handle it yourself. So what you do is you go to a specialist broker, a wholesale broker that does have the expertise and that can place the insurance and the wholesale broker and the frontline agent split the commission. And it's a good arrangement for um, agencies that need that special assistance. So my stock and trade is my specialization and I need to be able to persuade people that might do business with me that I have the requisite specialty that will help them place the business and service their client. And so one of the ways to do that is to become known as an expert in that field. And that's where the blog comes in. And so I'm developing a brand as an expert on DNO insurance that that's, you know, not only directed to my most target audience, those would be uh, partners, but also the DNO insurance generally, the DNO insurers, the DNO attorney claims attorneys. And so that, um, you know, as a result of years of hard work on it, I think I do have a well-established reputation as an expert in the field of directors and officers liability insurance. So um, my existing clientele or prospective future clientele making inquiries about me will hear back from others in the industry, you know, what my reputation is, what my profile is. And I'm able to maintain that 
by, um, you know, uh, an outreach that really at this point encompasses the entire Dino insurance industry. So I'm daily reinforcing, um, you know, my brand as a Dino insurance expert. So that's, that's what um, helps make it something that's worthwhile from a marketing and business development perspective, because it reestablishes my, my credentials as an expert in my field. That's very helpful. And I appreciate that. And thank you for that clarification. And I guess I should ask too, based on what you just told me, how do you balance the subject matter that you cover? Because given what I heard to be a fairly wide range of individuals to whom you want that blog to say, I'm Kevin, I know what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to Dino insurance, don't even think about anyone else but me for this line of insurance. How do you balance covering the various topics that your corners of your audience would be interested in? Well, I, my first rule of thumb is whatever I write about, it has to be something that I'm interested in <laughs> because I'm going to spend some time working on it. And it's usually time that I might be watching basketball on TV or writing, reading a detective novel. So if I'm going to take my personal time, it has to be something that I'm interested in. And, and that may or may not be consistent with the overall purpose of the blog, but it's just, it's a rule of thumb for me. I'm not going to spend the time if it's not something I'm interested in. So there are topics that arguably others in, in my field might think are interesting or important, but I'm just not going to write about it because they're not interesting to me. But the other thing is, I, I, I feel that at, over time, I've established a role at really telling other people what's important, that, that they go to my blog to find out what's important. Um, and, and I do a series of various now well-established features throughout the course of the year that are basically designed to be sort of roundups to kind of establish what I think are the, the top, hot topics and what's going on in, with respect to those issues. And I really do think that as a result of the many years I've been doing this, those are um, highly regarded, highly referenced um, uh, resources uh, by the industry. So rather than kind of commenting on the dialogue, I'm, I'm kind of establishing the dialogue. Um, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think there would be too much disagreement with me on that. I, I, I'm really just kind of describing what I think I see happening as a result of the years of, of maintaining the blog. That's, that is a great point that is widely applicable to really any professional services, individuals and firms and their thought leadership marketing efforts, which is Probably the best way to go about thought leadership is to create the content yourself. But if you can't create it, you can curate it. And that is a close second because by the mere nature of you curating, and you hit this right on the head, Kevin, by just merely curating the content, you are signaling the importance of that to your readership. And yet just because you were not the Reuters reporter or the Wall Street Journal reporter or the local Michigan reporter who covered this topic, the fact that you came across it and found maybe it's the entire story or maybe it's a little nugget in that story that could still have relevance to your audience, especially if they weren't already on the lookout for that kind of information. I mean, you could imagine if people wanted to find a DNO case that came down from an appellate court state or federal, they could probably find it. They know someone given their industry, given their corporation, they could probably get someone to pull a case. But if you are out there looking at a wider kind of swath of what's going on in the industry, then you provide even more value because you are scraping those areas of the earth where others aren't. And then to your point, you can highlight and set the table, set the agenda by pointing out, hey, you know what? This is really interesting and we don't see this covered enough, but yeah. and then you dabble and in if it. I, if I can, I, I'd like to add something to that because I want to comment on something that I see a mistake a lot of law firm blogs make on precisely this point. They may be doing a great job curating and identifying case law, but I, you know, I, it's almost like, who cares? Tell me, tell me why it matters. What difference does it make? So what that the Second Circuit issued this opinion? What does it matter? What's the significance? How does it fit? How does that affect what I need to be worrying about in my day-to-day -day job? And I don't think the law firms do that. They, you know, they do a very good job summarizing the case and saying what the holding is, but they don't take it the next step and say, why does it matter? And, and I, I think that, to me, holds back a lot of law firm blogs. Um, they do a great job on what the curatorial services you just described, 
but they're not they're not marshaling the information in a way that makes it useful and, and digestible by their audience. Um, and and also it's kind of boring. It would be a lot more interesting if they said the answer to the question, who cares? Um, then they'd have a blog that people would read because they feel like they need to to understand what's going going on. So uh, that that's a, maybe maybe not an opinion you you solicited, but it, it's one <laughs> that I happen to observe a lot about law firm blogs. I think a lot of law firms want to be the news breaker. They don't want to always be the analyzer. And mm -hmm. it's frustrating because you've got some law firms that think that if I get first into Kevin's inbox with my discussion of a recent Fifth Circuit decision that is relevant to his business and relevant to our relationship, then I'm going to get a gold star and maybe the next matter that comes down the pipe because I got this inbox first. But you can come to the inbox a few days later with a bit more, to your point, a more of a so what and a now what yeah analysis. Yep. Exactly. And lawyers can rest assured their clients are smart enough to say, gee, even though Kevin got to me on Friday and other firms got to me on Tuesday, but damn, Kevin's analysis is much more robust and much more helpful. Like you can rest assured these clients are smart enough to know <laughs> just because I got it first doesn't mean that it's the last word, yeah. the final word, or even the best word on that mm -hmm. topic. Yeah, I agree with that. How do you handle deciding what to write about? Do you have a process for scraping new sites or getting email alerts? How, how do you handle, because I would imagine if you're not careful, you could be writing blog posts every day, all day, because there's so much going on in the world of DNO insurance, or at least in issues that are somewhat collateral to it, but you can draw a connection between that and your audience. Well, coming up with what I'm gonna write about is probably the most important and the hardest part of the whole process. Um, as you might expect, I have many um, news sources, uh, aggregating services, and so on that I monitor, um, and and other um, bloggers and and other you know sources of of information, um, and you know that's sort of a, a daily um, throughout the day process, um, watching what's what's coming across my email box, what's showing up in my internet feed, and so on. Um, you know, I'm looking for something, first of all, as I said before, that I want to write about, but second of all, that I, I, I recognize as a, a development that's, to use a phrase that I say to myself, it's blog worthy. It's, it's just, it's <laughs> worth writing about. Um, and, it, it, you know, if I can't see the hook, even if though, you know, it's a Supreme Court case, but I just don't see the hook, I'm probably not going to write about it. I may wind up writing about it a few days later when I do see the hook. But I'm, I, I, if I don't see it right away, I'm going to continue to look till I come up with an idea that is blog worthy, um, that is worth me spending my time. Uh, you know, the, the most fr frustrating field in the world for me is when I come up empty and I can't come up with something and I, and I feel kind of thwarted and frustrated. Um, but I figure that's better than writing something that isn't really all that interesting or important. Um, then in the long run, it's better to, to provide good content than to just provide content for its own sake. Um, and, you know, coming up with those things that are going to be blog worthy is a never ending process. And it begins, the clock resets. The moment I set, I hit publish on today's post, the clock resets and it starts all over again and it never ends. Um, I try and keep a few ideas in the hopper and there are a few perennial topics that I will return to again and again because they, they just never go away. Um, but still there are days when I, I just can't come up with anything and I just have to accept that and, you know, kind of close my eyes to the idea that I, I haven't come up with anything and hope that tomorrow I find something that is, that is interesting. Um, I do find that I do need to maintain content. If I drop off for a few days, I start losing le readership and it's hard to, to get them back. It's funny how, um, tentative the hold is on it's sort of the peripheral incredible. readers. Yeah, so um, there is an incentive on me to, to try and come up with topics, but I, I don't try and force it either. I, I, if I just don't have an idea, I don't have an idea. And that's going to be a day where I don't publish any content, but um, you're, you're right. When there, there are a lot of developments and um, there are days when there's more to write about than I think my audience can absorb. So I just have to, you know, decide what's the most topical and go with that and, and save the other ideas for another day and hope they don't become stale in the meantime. You, you danced around a topic that uh, I think you actually alluded to before talking about the law firms that don't give a more analysis in their pieces. That topic is trust. 
when you have readership, especially over 16 years that you've built, there's a relationship there that, yeah, some people are transactional, they'll Google some aspect, they'll find a blog post, they get it from you and they move on. But if you want to build a relationship, there's, there's trust, whether it's your children, whether it's your family, your, your spouse, your coworkers, whatever. You're building a relationship with your readership. And if you start going off the deep end with your topics and you start to either veer away from what they're interested in or take approaches to the content that doesn't jive what they're looking for, you're violating trust. And I think you have to walk, you've alluded to it, you have to walk a fine line of, okay, there are just some days where I don't have anything that I think rises to the level that would be of interest to my audience. It's not blog worthy. I'm not going to force it because to your point, if you've got readers that are going to depart or lose interest, if you're not giving them interesting content every so often, if you still give content often, but it's not along the lines of what they're looking for, you risk alienating them. And it sounds foolish that you're going to alienate people who just read your blog, but that's how relationships happen, right? Like you, you draw people in based on the content you create, and then you could repel them if you're not creating the right kind of content that fits with what they're looking for. The other thing to that, I agree with everything you just said, Wayne. The, the thing I would add is in this day and age, everyone in my audience has many resources they can turn to. And, and it, to the point that I think all of us, you know, are, are right on the verge sometimes of just being overwhelmed by the noise. So you want to be able to um, differentiate yourself within the mass of different sources they might turn to. And you want to be reliable. Um, and, and being a reliable, trustworthy source um, is a way to ensure that in, in all the clamor, your voice will be heard. That's hard to maintain. And, and I think that it, it is kind of the pact you make with your readers that if you give me your time, I'll pay you back with something that was worth the time that you spent. Building on the topic of trust and trying to create content that our audiences want to consume, have there been instances where the audience has reached out to you, they've raised their hand, they've indicated they are paying attention, are they giving you requests, are they asking you to chat with them more about a particular topic, have you seen your blog post lead to speaking engagements, just what are some of the ways that your audience has indicated they're out there, they're paying attention, and how has your blogging efforts borne fruit in terms of whatever goals you were hoping to achieve? I was yes to all of the above, I've seen all <laughs> of those things. Um, probably the most gratifying is, is from time to time I will get clearly um, very, um, in, you know, intentional messages of gratitude um, that, you know, someone found something useful or important on my site and they, they wanted to let me know that m my blog was helpful to them. Um, and, um, you know, I, probably along those lines, the thing I find most helpful is to get notes from young practitioners, whether attorneys or just insurance professionals, um, who say that they, you know, they, they weren't getting any training from their employer, but they, they learned a lot about uh, the content of what they were doing from my site. Um, I have been fortunate to get many speaking in, engagement requests. And really in the last, say, 10 years or so, um, that's become international. And, and I'm always very struck and gratified when I go to uh, speak in places as diverse as London or Singapore or Sydney or Sao Paulo or Beijing or Ljubljana, Slovenia, that there's a large audience of people who tell me they read my blog, which is just great. Um, you know, if, if I can I tell you a couple of quick war stories about Please. Just how, how that has translated this this year. Um, I had two very funny experiences being introduced to, to international audiences. In May, I, I spoke to a, an audience of German insurance professionals in Munich, and the young woman that introduced me introduced me as the Pope of DNO. <laughs> which I, I thought said something about how much uh, respect or uh, trust I had developed uh, through the years. But um, even better, um, just a few weeks ago, I was in Singapore speaking to a insurance industry um, educational session, and the attorney that introduced me described me as the Tom Hanks of the DNO insurance industry that I'm highly respected and everybody likes me, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, my, my wife didn't see the humor of it, but uh, probably nothing will ever top being described as the Pope of DNO. Um, the, the, the last anecdote that goes with the Singapore experience is I was approached by a young uh, industry professional who was from the island of Mauritius, 
And she told me that she wanted to get her picture taken with me. And I said, why on earth do you want to get your picture taken with me? And she says, well, I, you're the DNO diary guy. You're world famous. And as I said to my wife later, if somebody from Mauritius tells you you're world famous, at that point, you, you can probably qualify as world famous. So, the, the you know, the blog is out there 24-7, silently reaching people that I don't even know. I don't I can't know who they are, what they're looking for, if they find what they're looking for. But slowly, gradually, over the course of many years, um, you know, I, I've managed to greatly expand my reach and reach um, a very diverse international audience that, you know, regularly comes back to my site for things that are important to them for their day to day jobs. Um, and they tell me so they tell me they do that. So it's been great. Um, but it took a long time to get to that point, too. You've identified a couple of points I want to follow up on. One, the fact that your blog is advocating for you 24-7, 365. It doesn't take any sick days. There's no snow days. There's no issues with the commute. It is advocating for you no matter what you're doing in your life, professionally, personally. At this very moment, someone could be Googling a series of keywords or a sentence and find your Dino diary and become become informed and get good feelings, good vibes, because you provide that information. And what's interesting to me is that still there are lawyers out there and really, again, any professional service providers, but for our purposes, lawyers who don't understand that, yes, it is great to fly across the country and give a 45 minute presentation to an industry conference or to write a long form law review article that really dives down into the weeds of your particular legal practice or an area of law that you want to get into. But the fact that you could have a podcast episode or record a video, and that is like a 30, 40 minute presentation that could be repeated time and time and time again, or to be able to, instead of writing a 40,000 word, you know, practically treatise on some issue, being able to deliver what 40, 1000 word blog posts, it, it takes these traditional ways of marketing and BD and repackages them for the modern digital world and it actually expands the reach if you didn't blog nothing personal kevin if you didn't blog i'm not sure you'd have those international opportunities that no, you have no, today. i would not i would not no, how do absolutely you, how do you spend your time researching and actually writing we talked a little about your process for finding topics but if you had to put a time amount on the time you spend each day researching and then writing, what's that total number on an average basis? Uh, it's a big number, and, and I, I hesitate to, to put a, a specific number out there because it might scare away prospective bloggers. I think if you're going to have a successful blog, you need to be prepared to devote some time. I don't think there's any way around it. I spend a lot of time on the weekend working on my blog. Um, you know, uh, I, I often try and work ahead a little bit just to provide a relief valve so I have time during the week to do my, my regular day job. I spend a lot of time on the block. Um, it, it, it is several hours a day. Um, it can, the amount of time I spend can depend on how complex the topic is I'm working on. Um, often I have more than one blog post at a time I'm working on. Um, it, the, I, I'm also somewhat old fashioned because I started law practice way back in the, the stone ages. Um, I still often draft by putting pen to paper, which I know sounds incredibly antiquated, but um, for me, there's something about the proximity of the pen and the page that makes me feel very close to what I'm writing. Um, I, I can and sometimes do compose uh, on, at the keyboard, and um, when time is short, I do that. Do that. But um, the the old-fashioned compositional technique of pen on paper is never going to die for me. That probably adds time because I write it out and then I have to retype it. I'm a, a pretty fast typer, but still that adds time. Um, it, it is the, the rewriting process is the most important. Um, you write quickly and then you then you fix it up and fixing it up is probably the more important part. Uh, you know, because I publish every day or close to every day, there's always still a point where you have to hit publish. And that's the part that's hardest for me because Going back, I see that um, many um, unseen or latent mistakes are there um, and, and got wound up on my site. And I don't always have time to go back and fix everything. So it's, it can be very painful for me to go back and read some of my old stuff because the, ob the errors are so obvious and they just reach out and punch me in the stomach. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I just have to accept that it would be great 
if I had a dynamic where there was um, a third party that could be my my text editor, but you know, I'm the circulation department, I'm the complaint department, I'm the editing department, I'm the the graphics department. I you know I have to do all those things, and I have to accept that the editorial department isn't always up to its job, and sometimes lets some things through, and that that hurts me a lot. Uh, but I'd never get anything up there if I if I got, allowed myself to get um, caught up in that. Well, as the saying goes, the the perfect is the enemy of the very good. Yes. Uh, and and when it comes to content, you just have to press publish. And obviously, you know, you're not going to spend ten minutes writing a blog post and hit publish. Like, but at what at what number does uh, the number of of proofreads start to you know not make sense? You know, five, ten. Like, how often can you read a 900 word blog post before you lose your mind? It's, and it's you start closer to, to five than to. The, yeah. the 10 for me personally, I, I would say if I could do a sixth run after a time break, I would be able to see it afresh and find some of those mistakes. But that's that's where the the sort of the blogging format, you know, can can, um, you know, be an impediment because you don't have the time to step back like that, especially if, if what you're writing about is something that's, you know, it's a hot topic. It's timely. You want to get it up. You want to get it, you know, published so that it's up in time to make this day's email distribution. So, um, you know, it, it it's just a, an, an attribute, I think, of the blogging medium that you're going to have that. Unless you've got a team of people that is working together, collaboratively. I, I think it just comes with the territory. We can go back to the idea of trust that we talked about earlier. You've built trust over 16 years. You're not putting out content that is going to make your audience roll their eyes. You're not selling eBooks. I assume you're not often selling eBooks, training courses, some things that people not sometimes doing do. Any of that. Right. In fact, you'll, you'll see, I don't even use, I write about insurers all the time. I don't even use the name of the insurer. I just say the insurer because I don't want anybody to think I'm saying something about a specific insurer. <laughs> It's just relevant that it was an insurer that did whatever I'm talking about. I do a lot of things to make it clear. I'm not supporting or criticizing anyone or anybody. Uh, and, if, and if I'm going to say something critical about so something or somebody, and I know I, I can't avoid saying it, I won't use the name. I won't name the person because I just don't want to be, I, I try to stay away from that as much as I can. I'm not promoting anything. I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just trying to provide a source of information. And that goes to the trust factor, which is yeah. you're providing trustworthy content. Your audience will be willing to excuse a sentence or two that could have probably be worded a bit better, but in the interest of, interest of time, you had to leave it the way it was. Like, don't I hope forget. So. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Unless you have people who are emailing you and saying, "Hey, idiot, what are you doing here? This is not the right thing." Or well, you people do mistake. email with corrections, and I'm always grateful when they do, particularly if it's a really egregious typo. I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, there are people that do, and, and I'm grateful for that. That's a great engaged audience. They're paying yeah. attention, yeah. and they feel connected to you enough to reach out and talk to you about that. You mentioned looking back at some of your older pieces and the gram grammatical errors or other errors might slap you in the face. But taking a step away from that kind of mm -hmm. style and, and grammar, how has your content evolved as we stand here today chatting, looking back over the past decade and a half, which is crazy, how has your content evolved substantively from when you started to today? Yeah, probably the, the first change, and it was fairly early on, is I, just on my own, it was almost a natural development, went from being more of a clipping service to more of a commentary service, um, in part because people were asking me questions, and I realized they had those questions, and maybe I needed to anticipate them and answer them. So that's, that's probably number one. Number two, I've allowed sort of the outer periphery of what is what I see as my bailiwick to expand a little bit. Um, over time, I've written about more international topics only because I've gained an appreciation that I have an international audience. And along the way, without even intending to do it, I've become a reliable source on international topics. Um, that was never part of my mission when I set out, but it's, it's sort of become part of my mission now. Um, I, I've, just as the audience has to gain trust with the blogger as a blogger, I've gained trust with the audience. And so some experiments that I tried fairly early on have become standard features. Um, starting in 2011, I recall the exact date, I did something that I was very, very nervous about doing. I had a business trip to Europe and I decided just to write about my travel experience. Obviously not a core blog topic, um, not at all what, what was within my, my agenda. And I was very wary about doing it. And I thought I would get a lot of criticism, but instead the reaction was very positive. And so since that time, I have 
regularly written about my travels, just as travels, not as not as um, as they might pertain to my experience as a Dino insurance professional. And um, that's become a very fulfilling part of the blog for me. And many people tell me it's their favorite part of the blog too, that they, they, they do like the travel posts and they miss them, say during the pandemic when I wasn't traveling. Um, you know, it, it's been a, a really rewarding part. Um, I took a risk, I took a chance. Um, and if I'd gotten pushed back, I would have dropped it. Um, building on that more recently, um, I started writing about arts um, and literature. Just I called it as a feature I call Sunday Arts. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's over the weekend. People don't have to click through if they don't want to. And many people don't. Uh, but some people do and some people enjoy it. Um, it's not during the work week, so I'm not taking up anybody's time. And if they don't want to read, they won't. But it's been something, again, that was fulfilling for me and that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about. Um, I wouldn't have done either of those things, the travel posts or the arts posts at the beginning. Um, and it's really only getting a little bit more familiar, familiarity with and confidence in my audience that they started to do those things. But again, I do it in ways that are um, re respectful of the audience. I'm not forcing information on them. I'm not trying to sell anything. Um, and I'm not trying to um, you know, sell them uh, anything about what I'm trying to do other than just use the vehicle that I've created as a way to exchange other types of information that I happen to find interesting. The irony is that by people reading your DNO posts would have developed a fondness for you based on the value you're giving them, the information you're providing them. And then they get to see through these other posts, the travel posts and the art posts, the more of the human side of Kevin, which endears themselves even more to you because now they are knowing about your personal life. They've got your your professional life and it almost like just strengthens the glue, the adhesion between your audience and you. And to your point, you waited. This was not like the first day or the first week or the first month of blogging. And you tested it out. And if it was bad, if people would have said, what the hell are you doing? Give me my DNO content. You would have said, great. It's pretty much a very low I thought risk. That's what people were going to say. Yeah. I, I fully anticipated that I would get pushback like that. I never have. I mean, I've written many, many travel posts. I mean, quite the opposite has happened. I have people reach out to me asking me if I will do their city, you know, come visit their <laughs> city and, and do a blog post about it. So, you know, it's had quite the opposite impact. I, I'm still careful about it. I don't overdo it. You know, I, I don't, um, I don't overindulge. I, I you know, I, I don't include pictures of my wife and stuff like that. I, you know, I, I try and keep it sort of on an informational level than a personal self-indulgence level. I should have asked you when your wife is there or she heard that someone called you the Tom Hanks of DNO Insurance, the look on her face and her reaction to that, a different story for a different day. As we start to wrap up here, first, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to chat with me about the Dino Diary and just blogging and content generally. As we start to wrap up, though, can you give some advice either for in-house marketers at law firms or lawyers regarding getting lawyers off the sidelines and onto the playing field when it comes to content marketing and thought leadership marketing, particularly with blogging, but perhaps other methods as well? You are a lawyer, you know lawyers. What would you say to someone who is thinking about getting off the sidelines but is apprehensive for one of the many reasons lawyers tend to be apprehensive about marketing and BD efforts? Yeah, I mean, just starting with the way that you can leverage your own skill sets, the skill sets you already know you have. I mean, I think a lot of young attorneys, for instance, say, well, I don't have any prospective client contacts. How how can I do business development? Or I'm just shy. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm an introvert. And, and I, you know, the kind of idea, I'm not the kind of person that's going to, you know, do golf outings and, or sporting events and stuff like that. How, how can I separately develop business contacts, develop a business profile? You know, if you've gotten through law school, and you're, you're a young lawyer, you, you know how to write, you know how to present yourself, you have opinions, um, you have ideas, and you probably enjoy uh, expressing your opinions and ideas in writing. And um, so I think it's a natural fit. Um, you know, you can start out, um, you know, tentatively, maybe doing a post on LinkedIn or something like that, just to kind of get your feet wet and kind of get familiar with, with doing it. But, you know, we said before in this conversation, the great thing about using 
these kind of tools is that it's out there 24 seven. It's reaching people you don't even know, people you might never get a chance to talk to and you know, establishing connections. And you know, particularly for that younger attorney that doesn't quite know where to begin and um, knows going in, they're not gonna be the kind of uh, business development person, person that's gonna do fishing trips and, and stuff like that. That you know, what you wanna do is develop a reputation for being a, you know, a professional with expertise this is a good way to start. It's a good way to do it. And if, if you take a long-term view, if you don't expect success right away, if you don't, you know, it was years. I mean, it was literally probably plus years for me before I could have made a financial case that it was worth the time that I was spending. Uh, now it helped that I was getting payback psychologically and, and so on from doing it. And so I didn't, I wasn't doing that financial measurement. It came, it came eventually. It just took a while. So I, I would say to that person just starting out, um, you know, be confident in your strengths and talents. Um, be be um, active, take the extra time from your work day. You know, you're busy, you're professional, you have other things to do, but it's worth the investment to kind of develop um, an approach and a, and a voice that that um, reflects your professionalism, your expertise, it helps develop your reputation and helps you find um, a space. And, and I think it's a great opportunity, for, especially for lawyers because we're trained as writers, so it's it's a good fit. Um, just don't write like a lawyer. <laughs> Learn to write something other than a lawyer and you'll do great. Kevin, that's great advice. I couldn't have said it better myself. Again, thanks for your time. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do so? I can be reached at, by, via email. It, it's Kevin, K E V I N dot LaCroix, L A C R O I X, at RT Specialty dot com, all one word, RT Specialty. You can always find my blog, uh, which is the DNO Diary. I'm not hard to find. And you can connect with me straight through the blog site as well. Um, so, you know, and, and I always enjoy hearing from people, so don't hesitate to reach out. And by all means, if you attend a presentation with Kevin, ask him to get a photo and get his wife in there too. I'm sure she'll, she'll love that, uh, that image as well, that, that photo as well. Kevin, again, thanks for your time. And I look forward to talking to you sometime soon again. You too, Wayne. Thank you very much for having me. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of Legally Contented. Thanks so much for tuning in. Check out the episode show notes for more information about our guests and for links to resources that we discussed during the episode. We'd appreciate your feedback and recommendations for future guests. Email us at hello at legallycontented.com. Hello at legallycontented.com. We would appreciate if you told your colleagues about this podcast, if you subscribe to the podcast and urge them to subscribe as well. And while you're at it, maybe you could even rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, thanks so much for tuning in to Legally Contented.